What happens when multiple shocks hit us? Have we reflected on 2020 and what have we learned? Have we identified the cracks in our systems? How can we enable ourselves to be better prepared for the next crisis? What should we do when we know that uncertainty and complexity are states of nature? We will never have full knowledge. There are no templates to tell us exactly what to do. We will always make mistakes. By acknowledging the above, we allow ourselves to experiment, place early bets, fail fast and try again. We will acquire the missing information, we will figure out where are the holes, and we will be able to think ahead. Today, my guests are Rashri Agarwal and Constance Helfat. Rashri is a professor in entrepreneurship at the Robert H. Smith School of Business, University of Maryland. She studies the evolution of industries, firms, and industrial careers as fostered by the twin engines of innovation and enterprise. Constance, or Connie, how everyone knows her, is a professor in technology and strategy at the Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth College. Her research seeks to understand the nature of strategic change in organizations, particularly change that is the result of emerging technology, knowledge, and capabilities. Welcome to a new episode of Building Resilience, the podcast that hosts some of the most brilliant minds who have studied resilience or have tremendous experience in navigating ever-changing waters. If you find value in it, the best way to support our work is by leaving comments and subscribing to the YouTube channel. Thanks and enjoy today's talk. Hello, Rajri. Hello, Connie, and welcome to Building Resilience. I'm very happy to be hosting you. Thank you for having us be part of the show. Yes, very happy to be here. Happy as well. Just to get things off and start them so everyone can get to know you a bit. Can you introduce yourselves, your research, and how come you have this big interest in organizations and their survival and resilience? Right from the beginning, even from my PhD days, I have been very, very fascinated by innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, and the important notion out here is that why do I want to study innovation and entrepreneurship? Well, because um, innovation and entrepreneurship are the two engines that both create new opportunities, but at the same time destroy existing structures, existing ways of doing things. Uh, the important thing to remember, however, is that this innovation just doesn't come out of nowhere like manna from heaven. And so for me, the reason why organizational resilience is so important is because the agents of change are often from within the economy itself. They can be existing firms, existing individuals. And even after change is being introduced by someone else, you still need to figure out how are you going to respond to the change. And so if you don't respond to the change, of course, you risk being destroyed or failure. But then the other thing also is that failure at one level does not necessarily mean failure at other levels too. So a lot of the research that I have done has gone across levels of analysis where it may very well be that Firms may not be resilient, but the individuals that work within the organizations may end up starting new organizations. Uh, where does innovation come from? How do people get together within organizations to then think and make sense of change? All of these are topics that are immensely fascinating to me. Thank you, Rashri. Interesting for me to hear what Raj we had to say because we're so similar in our interests uh, and even where we started. I mean, I've always been interested in change. I mean, that's what strategy and organization is about. It's, it, it's not that relevant to think about staying in place, partly because organizations don't have a choice. There is always something new coming along. and. I also started being really interested in technological change. And again, that's all about uh, figuring out what to do in the future. And I'm interested in not only how firms adapt to what's going on outside of their entity, but how they create change, which is, again, partly you can do that through technological innovation and other ways of innovating. Even changing your organizational form will help you make other innovations. So I think, you know, that's always been my interest. I think almost every paper I've ever written has time in it in some way, shape or form because of that. Um, and I also am interested in the 
organization as an entity and as a, and the role of individuals. So it's sometimes, you know, people don't always understand that. I have some papers on individuals and some paper on organizations and they're like, how can you do this? I'm like, well, they both matter for change. So if you, you can't ignore them and they work together, right? If you change the form of an organization, it's going to change how individuals interact and what their contributions might be and how individuals interact might lead to the way organizations change what they do and how they're set up. Uh, so I've always been interested in this and, um, I just keep finding new ways of thinking about it and the world, you know, always sends us curves, curveballs. So then you think, oh, how are organizations going to deal with this and what changes are they pioneering? So that's that's what I'm interested in and that's what my research is about. Now you spike my curiosity because as you just said, Connie, uh, a lot of people think of individuals as separate from organizations. But you just both mentioned that they are not, right? And in my view as HR, they are not as well. So one question, how, how does individual resilience connect to organizational resilience? Is one building on the other? Is one leading to the other? So, so again, um, you know, as Connie mentioned, one of the important things to talk about is the concept of resilience itself connotates how are you going to respond to some shock, some things that have happened in your external environment? And, you know, uh, going back to history and time and evolutionary perspective that Connie and I have a lot in common with, which is, of course, why we work so well together and we've co-authored papers together. Too. Uh, you know, I started off as an industrial organizational economist that wanted to study how industries evolve. But then I gravitated to strategy because I said, well, in, industries don't make decisions. Firms make decisions, right? Their strategies are, in fact, the vehicles through which innovation and entrepreneurship comes about. And as both of you may already be shaking your head about, it's no firms don't make decisions. Individuals make decisions. And so to try and separate out individual decision making from organizational decision making, I mean, there is value in doing that, by the way, because, you know, individuals make decisions, but they take into consideration the context and the firms and the structures and the systems that are in place both enable or inhibit that. So to your answer about how does individual and organizational resilience come together, they're intertwined in very uh, important ways. But the good thing is, and at least I tend to be an eternal optimist, if certain organizational structures are going to impede certain in individuals from enacting in ways that build resilience, then these individuals also have agency to move to other organizations and create change in other structures. Now, this podcast is going to be seen and the target audience is mainly org design uh, practitioners, business leaders, and HR. So decades of research and decades of research together. What are some practical applications of your research that we can focus on discussing today and maybe also touching on the angle that you take when you think about organizational resilience? All right, I guess I could start. Uh, so... I think I'm known for what's, what are called dynamic capabilities. Uh, these are uh, organizational and uh, managerial capabilities that are directed toward change, which is a very broad bucket, right? So it, uh, it includes individuals at all levels of the organization. It includes um, capabilities that involve groups of people working together. And that includes thinking about this for the organization in aggregate. Uh, it includes capabilities for actually structuring relationships. Um, so, and plus other things that are very obvious like technological innovation, undertaking mergers and acquisitions, which of course reorganizes the entire company, uh, you, know, ally, you know, undertaking alliances. There, there are many things like that. So, I mean, all these things are extremely practical, right? I mean, how do you do M&A well? How do you figure out uh, an acquisition that'll position you well for the future? When should you be divesting? And then how do you 
deal with the resulting impact on the organization? What do you have to change and reconfigure within your organization? And how do you undertake technological innovation effectively? What do you do with it? Once you've got an innovation, how do we even tell you have one? Right? What's the best way to organize R and D? Right? You know, is is I think we know there's not one size fits all. That this is contingent on the history of the organization, the individuals in it, the environment they're in. So those are the kinds of things that I think about. Rashri, how about you? So uh, practical applications for my research, let me kind of take it at a more general level and then also talk about particularly the current crisis and what might be practical applications even in that context. So on the one level, I mean, first of all, of course, everything that Connie said, right? We need, um, so for me at least, research that we do is like a GPS that provides practitioners, managers, the, the map right? It doesn't necessarily say which direction you should go in, but it provides useful frameworks in sense making so that you could make these decisions, not necessarily to guarantee success, but at least to reduce the chances of um, of failure, right? And so for me, for instance, one of the important ways that research that Connie's done, I've done, or people that have been studying organizational resilience have done is, you know, one example is uh, generally speaking, enterprising managers, entrepreneurs and startups, they have a bias for action, right? Which is good. And that gets you uh, doing things, at least trying and experimenting. Uh, Then there is also this time for thinking and making sense of going on. So, you know, some of the research, for instance, that our colleagues are doing is thinking about the scientific method towards decision making under uncertainty. And, you know, for a scientific method, you really don't need scientist degrees in order to do that. What this really says is, you know, you take stock of what's out there and you make certain hypotheses about ways to act. But rather than just jumping on your first gut reaction of this is the way you should go, you pause and think about what may be alternative options and what are the underlying assumptions that could be causing you to go one way versus the other. And just having that check on your assumption can often guide you in terms of uh, resilience because at the end of the day, it's that decision-making under uncertainty that and better decisions create better resilience. How how do you see 2020 and what's happening to organizations and what's your insight on the severity of what's of the current crisis and the potential for further disruption and going further definitely the, the organizational resilience any new insights that you might have had during this year that maybe you didn't have uh, prior to this well so one thing that struck me was how fast organizations were able to adapt. It was incredible. Within a couple of weeks, they had, you know, medium-sized to large businesses, anyone who could work online was working online. And then they figured out ways of collaboration. I mean, it's changed everyone's work habits, lifestyles, and the work's getting done. I mean, I just thought that was stunning, actually, Uh, with sort of you know, for better or for worse, relatively little change in the organizational arrangements, right? That's what's so interesting. Um, And so I think that speaks to sort of the short-term operational adaptability, right? So, and resilience. Uh, You know, there's all kinds of pundits saying, oh, we've now revolutionized how people are going to work. I don't know, right? We have no idea, right? Maybe there'll be more working from home, more flex, you know, I think there might be more flexibility in the future for organizations where people can work online, but there's clearly an urge to get back to the office. And we all know what everyone's saying is you need the proverbial water cooler to, you know, to really be able to take advantage of all the insights of your employees, right? And the teamwork. Um, So I think it's, you know, to be determined what the long-term impact is. I do think it was enabled, the response was enabled by some other changes like the, the, you know, 
as technology and actually entrepreneurial firms have been pushed like Zoom have been pushing for the frontier of what's possible uh, with remote organizational work. Um, if we hadn't had that, it would have been much harder. So it's certainly enabled by some of these underlying technological and societal changes. Uh, and I expect those are going to keep going regardless of what happens you know, with the current disruption. And building off of Connie's uh, excellent point there, uh, you know, one of my Forbes op-eds that I had written came directly out of a thought experiment that I had executives in my MBA class do, right? And the thought experiment was very simple. What if COVID-19 had hit 25 years ago, right? And most of us were around in 1995, 1996, right? And what is amazing to think about is all of the technologies that we take for granted today that were not even around 25 years ago, right? All of the firms that we're relying on today that weren't even around. Amazon, essential for home delivery, right? So Connie is absolutely right. It's amazing, astounding to see that in spite of all of the challenges that were thrown at us with uh, lockdowns, thinking about being safe, uh, you know, how do you work virtually? How do you live your lives? Amazon, very critical for home delivery. Instacart, uh, you know, and all of these uh, sh grocery uh, um, apps and so on. These weren't even around less than 20 years ago. I mean, Amazon was just a small bookseller in 1995. Google wasn't even born in 1995, right? And if you think about Zoom, I mean, telemedicine, all of these things that we so take for granted weren't around. What's also important to understand is that this disruption has been facilitated not just by these startups, but also long living organizations, Microsoft, Johnson & Johnson, right? By the way, Pirel, not around before 1997, right? That's the first time that it came out. So the larger point of course is that our ability to survive crises as they come is to a large part dependent upon our earlier entrepreneurial and innovative spirit. And this is what is gonna to continue to take us through. So to Connie's point, right? Yes, this is disruptive. If you look at academia, hugely disruptive, right? I mean, all of us have had to worry about how do we go ahead and you know, completely transformed to online classes. And I can tell you this regardless of who my colleagues are, they have been working really, really hard to adapt, to situate themselves, to learn. So crises give us opportunities or rather no choices, if you will, to take on this adaptation and a resilient mindset. In the long term, I think many of these things are going to become intrinsic to the way we're now used to doing that world, right? So Connie is right. I don't think that the office is going to go away in the near term future because socialization, communication, coordination, we are at the end of the day, humans. We thrive on interaction, on brainstorming, particularly the novel ideas come about when you're bringing in disparate knowledge streams together. And there is a huge amount of serendipity that no amount of planning can create. So I think that, you know, we may change our work practices, but there are some things that are good about the old that we will keep. There are some things that are good about the new that we will keep. And that's what resilience is about anyway. Should there be a conclusion that those who practice change so far and adaptation will be quicker to adapt in the future and those who really treasure more stability and not going through change, and they've maybe been in stable markets where they didn't have to change for years and maybe decades, they would be more prone to failure. So they should learn to change and adapt, maybe even for change's sake, just run experiments, exercise that muscle of change. Would that be something... A good conclusion or a bad conclusion? I think the research actually supports that conclusion rather strongly. Uh, so it's not just our opinion. Uh, you know, so for example, you know, Roshri's done work on nascent markets and market entry, and we all and pre-entry experience, meaning do you have experience 
you know, in the past that will enable you to enter a market in the future. And I've also looked at some of this. We know resoundingly that the answer to that is yes, you will perform better, All right? So, um, you know, one issue that comes up is it's not like some general muscle for change, right? It, I shouldn't say it's not, but it's not only that, right? Because organizations develop skills in certain types of change, right? So, you know, to go back to my mergers and acquisitions uh, example earlier, right? These involve certain types of ways of doing things. We call them routines sort of sometimes, although that it's not so narrow as the word would sound. But these ways of doing things, if you, this is about having the muscle to do this, right? That you can do it automatic, more automatically, right? But that means you have to know how to do certain types of change. So yes, there's a certain mindset that we're always going to be looking for opportunities in the future and how to react and how to change. But you also need the specific skills and capabilities in, in particular types of change. And, and to build on that, you know, look, stability is a good thing because stability provides you um, you know, so if everything was going to be disruptive, so think about it, right? We talk a lot about disruptive innovation as being a good thing, but do we want every year a new, brand new disruption in our lives? No, we don't, right? Stability actually, and, and Connie and I are actually, have had a lot of conversations about this, right? Major change actually is not something that we can continually adapt to on a regular basis. And a lot of our literature ends up talking about, oh, disruption is good, radical is good. But you know, we don't want to have that first Apple, one that was produced as a computer today on our desktop. And if you think about the 25 years or 30 years of incremental innovation and how much that itself enhances our life. So there are, Big changes and small changes. In fact, big changes create upheaval, but then stability enables you to innovate on the margin. And I don't want us to exclude the differences about innovating on the margins and how important that can be too. The mindset, of course, needs to be that of a growth mindset in individuals and in organizations. But that doesn't mean that change is good for change's sake. And it does not preclude us from, as Connie is saying, developing the skills to figure out when you're not throwing the baby out of the backwater, right? What is it that you need to keep that is essential and what's good? And what are the elements that you need to change? You have both uh, looked historically at what has happened in the crisis 2007 and 2008. What are the lessons that we can take from that crisis that we can apply today? Are they, can we compare the two or not so much? So, um, you know, there are different levels at which they're similar and of course at different, right? So the broadest level, one comparison is, hey, we survived the 2007, 2008 crisis when everybody during it was doom and gloom, things have ended for the, you know, and look, so it is a remarkable uh, story of resilience that we rose out of it then in order to come across and confront this crisis today and we're rising out of it now, right? And so this in some ways at that very broadest level is a testament to the human spirit. On a second level, you can also think about, you know, what do these two crises represent? They represent an enhanced need for, as I was saying before, decision-making under uncertainty. So both of these crises, you know, kind of shake our mind away from business as usual and require us to think through what do we do now? They also provide opportunities to figure out what were the holes what were the cracks in the system that we need to now watch out for sort of future crisis, which is going to come, we know that, right? How do we best enable ourselves to do that? But then at the level of that was a financial crisis, this is much more of a public health crisis. 
Uh, you know, some people say that that particular crisis caused a reduction in GDP that kind of lasted as a trend for the longest time, whereas this one may be a V-shape, right? There was a dramatic decline because of the lockdown, because of people having to be resilient. But there is the recovery to the GDP and the economy can be much faster. Uh, so I, I think I'll stop there to talk about how you need to think about, well, what is similar and what is different? And what lessons can we learn? So, I, I mean, Brah, I agree with what Rashi said completely. Um, you know, one thing that strikes me about these two crises is that they're they're system level crises, right? It's not one thing you can pinpoint and that alone sort of caused all the problems, right? I mean, it's the entire financial system. Right, had, you know, one piece led to another, led to another. Now we have a public health crisis, which is involved, like, you know, the entire world, economy, social systems, organizations, you name it, right? And and all these interlocking pieces. And I think um, people are not good at figuring out what to do in these situations. Uh, that means governments aren't good at it. It means leaders of organizations aren't good at it. Uh, these are a really big challenges. And I think if you take it down to even the level of an organization and ask how, what's required for resilience, yes, thinking ahead, you know, figuring out where the holes are before they hit you, but also thinking at a system level. How do all the pieces of your organization interact and what will happen if different shocks hit you? Right? How do you what will happen to all these pieces Right, and how do we think of them as a system? And I think that would be a very valuable thing to think more about. You both mentioned decision-making under uncertainty and systemic thinking and definitely complexity. But I also feel that this is where, that, that's, this is where the bottleneck is because it, it feels like it is too much and a lot of people get stuck, right? And they, the, the decision is not made, or it's made in the wrong way, or it's rushed in, or not all points have, have been taken into consideration, not all the data has been looked and analyzed. Uh, any tips and tricks on maybe where to start and how to swim through this uncertainty and complexity? So, you know, what is uncertainty? It is actually defined as the state of partial knowledge. Uncertainty arises because we don't know for sure. But then how is uncertainty resolved? It is not like you have this gigantic major revelation, again, like manna from heaven, right? And then all of the knowledge that you need to know is available. One of the things that I often worry about are the pundits that want to do what is called Monday morning quarterbacking right? Where, oh, let's have all of the relevant information and stuff. Life isn't like that. You're never going to have full information. So then how do you go about acquiring information? You go about acquiring information by experimenting. So I think that one of the things that we need to do in terms of how do we deal with it is first and foremost, embrace the fact that as humans, we're neither omniscient, as in knowing everything, nor infallible as in incapable of making mistakes. And I think that once we adopt that mind frame, it's actually very liberating. It gives us permission to experiment, but actively. It gives us permission to try things, but then constantly be integrating it so that one can look at it. And yes, it needs to allow us to make mistakes and not be judging of ourselves. So Connie made an excellent point, right? Governments don't know what's best. Organizations don't know why, what's best. And the reason is because we as individuals don't have full knowledge. But rather than criticizing ourselves for not knowing, which is a state of nature, what we need to do is embrace the fact that we want to do the best that we can. Some of us are better able to make those decisions than not. And that's where the definition of organizational success and resilience comes from. The same holds for governments, the same holds for entire economies, but that we need to trust that it will work out, especially if we have the right routines and the right mindset in place. Thank you. 
Yeah, I mean, I would add, it's interesting when you see, you know, the, part of the difference between the financial crisis and what we have now, the so financial crisis was very constraining, right? It, it, it didn't leave you that many options. You really, I think, or, you know, and, it, and it's hit one sector much more than others, whereas a pandemic hit all sectors, some more than others, but uh, it really hit everyone. And I think that managers and organizations were scrambling and some of them realize we have to do something, right? We have no choice. We have to do something. And there, even though there's no template for exactly what to do, people were drawing on their accumulated knowledge and connections and relationships and past opportunities that had come their way that they hadn't taken advantage of, but they'd kept, you know, sort of in the back burner in case they wanted it. So not all these people who've done well had prior experience with change, but what they had was knowledge and experience that they could leverage. They could put that together and say, ah, maybe I can use this, right? I've got this person on my Rolodex who pitched this idea to me in the past, and yeah, I passed on it, but oh, maybe this will work now. So those sorts of things are really important, right? So it's not just... Do you have experience changing, but do you have a whole raft of knowledge and capabilities that you can quickly leverage? Thank you. I have a question that I also asked uh, Professor Ranji Gulati, and that is, in your view, what is the final goal of resilience? Is it to get one more time to a stable point? Is it more to get an organization to be immortal? and last forever, what in your point of view, the goal of, of organizational resilience? Um, I can try taking a crack at that. I think that organizations themselves are very fluid structures in some ways. They change, they have to change, right? And at some point in time, at an end, you know, so what are organizations? Organizations are really a set of people who come together. These people may have different skills, different beliefs, different goals, different abilities, however you wanna define it. But an organization brings them together towards a common purpose. But as individuals, each and every one of us has the responsibility of defining our own purpose. One of the things that I talk about quite a bit is to take a lot of these concepts that we have in strategic management and entrepreneurship and apply it to ourselves, right? So just like a CEO of an organization in order to retain resilience or maintain resilience has to define four answers to four critical questions. What's my purpose? What does success look like to me? What's my value proposition? And with whom should I trade? Every one of us who are part of an organization needs to define these four questions for ourselves. And the answers to these four questions really define our journey. So the destination may be whatever it is, and it may change. But for me, resilience is about enjoying the journey. And it may very well be that for us as individuals, that journey may lead us to go and align with different organizations right, or align with different trading partners. But the focus of resilience and the long-term outcome of resilience is possible only if at both the individual and the organizational level, we focus on win-win outcomes. And by the way, for me, that means that I'm having fun in the process, right? Nobody's losing at my expense and I'm not losing at their expense, right? And so, that is what trade is about. That is what organizations are excellent to do when they bring individuals together and those that thrive within organizations creating these trade outcomes among people do better. And then these organizations, when they deal with others, are more resilient because they're focusing on win-wins. Now, don't get me wrong. That doesn't mean that there aren't going to be some people that are going to lose on the wayside. I'm not this you know, happy, happy person. There's no loss. But often competition is actually a secondary consequence. Those that collaborate more successfully end up being more successful and as a result, leave behind the, the organizations 
that aren't as good as collaborating. I would add to Rajshree's excellent points. Your question, it, it, you can take it from multiple perspectives, right? What is the organization's goals? What are the goals of the individual? And then what, what about society? Right? So I think from a societal point of view, it's there are many really overarching goals of resilience, right? You know, to enable the economy to grow, to enable people to meet their personal goals, to, to enable their families to thrive. Uh, you know, there are so many of these things where without organizations, these economic goals and societal goals are not possible. I think people lose sight of that. They somehow think society and the economy are separate from organizations. And so that's not true. <laughs> so I think that's the first point about resilience, right? Uh, I, I think the second point about resilience is for organizations to have the opportunities to take advantage of all the new things that are coming down the pike. Right. I mean, there's all kinds of opportunities for new products, new services that resilience enable. Right. And there are benefits of, you know, not having organizations survive, but the costly. Right. You would be much better off for the economy and for society if organizations could be resilient. Right. And push forward rather than the havoc of people losing their jobs, et cetera. I mean, certainly some of the best ideas come from entrepreneurial firms, but a lot of them also come from uh, existing organizations. So I think that's really important. Right. And then organizations, of course, want to survive right? <laughs> and grow. Right. So I think that resilience is very important for that. Thank you. Now, just some final maybe tips for organizations from your research. Is there something that you would like to leave our viewers with? Something that if they have to, if we have to narrow it down and leave them with three things or five things which are important to remember from this episode, from this discussion, what would these things be? So I think we've actually covered quite a bit of them. So at the risk of repeating myself, I would say uh, developing a mindset where you're comfortable with change and making decisions under uncertainty uh, is a very critical element uh, at the individual level. At the organizational level, then, that translates to making sure that your structures and your routines are not stifling change, right? So as we talked about earlier, stability is good, but inertia as in resistance is when stability goes over to that negative level, which is what you're stopping then being resilient. So are you within the organization inculcating an culture where your employees do feel empowered and enabled to voice their opinion. And you know, not every voice is going to have the same amount of uh, ability to, you know, some, some ideas are better than other ideas, right? So, but the fact is that if you're going to have an environment where all voices are heard, that's when you can sift through and get to the better ideas, right? And so at the organizational level, I think that that is key to resilience. Um, and then I think at uh, Connie's point, at the systems level, we really need to not create this, uh, in my opinion, the sense that businesses are bad, they're greedy, they are going to do things which is always in a win-lose type of a format, but reframe it as Connie excellently said, right? Organizations are a very critical way of us as individuals in the society of organizing economic activity. And when they have win-wins within, as well as win-wins outside, that's when societies thrive through. So at the system level, one of the things that's coming across to me is I was always, yes, it's evolution. It's always a positive movement, right? But if we undercut 
the engines of that positive movement. If we have institutions and markets that actually stifle innovation and entrepreneurship, then forward movement is not guaranteed. And the crises such as these will cause us to go back in time. And the best example in history is the Middle Ages. Right, where for a long period of time we did fall back, and there was very little innovation and entrepreneurship until the Renaissance period came by. So that would be what I would leave at. Right, at three things at different levels. So I'm going to echo what Raj had to say. <laughs> we always think alike. It's pretty funny. Uh, but first of all, I would say, um, and, and this. It goes back to some of what we said before. It's really important to be proactive, right? I mean, you want to be thinking about change before it hits you <laughs> if you're going to be resilient. And I think that this includes not only adapting change, but also shaping it, right? You want to be proactive in creating change in the way that is favorable to the organization that enables the organization to grow. Uh, and so... This involves a lot of things. Uh, one thing involves is what I call peripheral vision. Right? Really having the ability to figure out where are the opportunities coming from? Where are the potential uh, problems going to come from? And where, how do you get peripheral vision? Well, you get this from your organization, right? And so again, to Rajshri's point, it's at all levels, right? So you need structures in place that will allow you to figure out where is this from? I mean, down to the level of the individuals who are interfacing with your customers, your engineers who are dealing with the new technologies, all the way up to the top where hopefully the top management is scanning the environment on a regular basis to figure out where are the opportunities and then triangulating this information from the top to the bottom. And that's a really big organizational problem. It's something that particularly for large organizations, have trouble nailing. And I think that that is where org design choices are really critical in enabling organizations to have this peripheral vision and translate that information into ways of being proactive. So I think those are really big challenges. The other last thing I would say is you have to place bets and you have to place multiple bets. You cannot just be safe. We all know, for example, research on innovation has showed again and again, as well as theoretical models, that you cannot predict with certainty, to go back to Rajshri's point, where are the next successful technologies coming from? What are going to be the products that really take consumers by storm? You have to try things. You can't just place a bet on one big thing. And so you really need multiple bets. You place them early. Uh, and then you can figure out without huge investments uh, what appears to be getting traction. And sometimes you're too early, so you just keep them going at a low level. And again, you need an organization design that will let you do this, right? That builds in the possibility of running experiments all the time without, you know, sort of taking the organization off track of what it's actually doing right now. So I think that those are, are organization design challenges that really feed into um, the overall growth and opportunities of the organization. Thank you very much, Connie. At Rashri, Connie, this has been a really pleasure for me, a real pleasure for me. And I have learned very much today. So thank you very much. Thank you for your insights and sh thank you for sharing your research with everyone. Thank you, Yulia, for inviting us and talking to us. And Connie, I am always, always, um, I shouldn't be surprised anymore as to how um, consistent, complementary, and alike we are in our thinking. Um, and I do think that, you know, this conversation has been very inspiring to me too, because at, at, at a fundamental level, we as individuals, when we're dealing with resilient, you know, of course, we're going to rise to the occasion. Of course, we're going to be resilient. But one thing that I think I would like to leave all of us with is that us as individuals, we need to have moments where we reaffirm things 
principles, concepts that are important to us, because that is what gives us at the end of the day a fuel for our soul, that gives our spirit the energy to keep working on. So thank you, Connie. Thank you, Yulia, for asking these questions, which have kind of reaffirmed many of the principles that I firmly believe in. Yes, it's really been a pleasure. It's so much fun, Yulia. Thank you for inviting us and Rajshri. It, you know, it's, it's, it's so great because Rajshri and I have similar points of view, but we come up with some different uh, ways of thinking, you know, in the details. And I always learn from Rajshri and it's always energizing. Uh, optimism that Rajshri has is really fabulous. <laughs> and I think that if companies could bottle some of that optimism, it would go a long way toward resilience. <laughs> so, so thank you guys both very much. Yeah, I agree. There's a lot of uh, positivity in what both of you say, actually, because it's very fun to read your articles written separately or together. And you're both very positive about things, right? Most of the views are, oh, you shouldn't do that. Companies are wrong here. Companies are, mistake are mistaken here. This is what we don't uh, manage to learn or what we don't manage to implement. But you always come from such a positive view, both of you. <laughs> so it, it, it has been a pleasure reading. Uh, you know, when you write, you don't necessarily see it from the perspective of a reader. So I really appreciated yeah. you saying that. It is. It is. It was very. It was very fun to read your research as well. I haven't been through all of it. I have to admit, because you <laughs> are both very prolific. But <laughs> I did manage to read a few. Thank you so much to both of you, and thank you for your time today. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.